afterwards via a link. Okay. And finally, I wanted to give you a snapshot roadmap of what we have for upcoming virtual events, mostly around the theme of spirits, more generally around the theme of gustatory uh, pleasures. So the next event we have is in a couple of weeks, June 25th, Science of Chocolate event with Professor Michael Sima from MIT. He's in uh, course three, Material Science and Engineering. He was my professor as a sophomore in our kinetics course. He did a little bit on chocolate. I loved it. And so now almost 20 years later, you know, I'm bringing him back to talk to us about the in-depth science of chocolate. Really looking forward to that event. In mid-July on the 17th, we've got the Irish Whiskey Masterclass that'll be featuring Redbreast. On July 31st, we're doing an art and whiskey blending event with Holly Saitawan, who many of you probably know is a, a whiskey uh, figure, a very prominent whiskey figure in the United States. And then finally on September 5th, we're planning on a rum masterclass with our fellow alum, Eduardo Bacardi, class of 2015, Mackey, who actually is the sixth generation of the Bacardi family and now is the director of marketing for a small uh, artisanal rum brand in Puerto Rico called Rondo Barrilito. And so he'll be joining us and actually even giving us a little virtual tour of their uh, facility down there in Puerto Rico. Lots of fun. Couple ways to stay in touch. If you um, might not be hearing about these through your club consistently, I recommend you join my email, email list where I, I um, post about these uh, events. So you'll definitely get notice of those. We also just formed um, a group on Facebook called the MIT Fine Spirit Society. So it's, it's new. Uh, I'll send the link to that as well. I'd invite you to join. That's a way for us to just stay connected in between events. And uh, I can also update you as well there with plans for future events. Okay. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Sammy Karachi, who is the lead for cocktails at Taylor & Taylor Whiskey Company. We've had Taylor & Taylor with us before. We had Nick Taylor last month doing a deep dive on single malt scotch whiskey. And now uh, we have Sammy with us tonight. Sammy was previously the brand ambassador for uh, the McAllen and has now joined the team at Taylor & Taylor. And it's his first time presenting to the MIT crowd tonight. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Sammy to the MIT world. <laughs> Sammy. Thanks, Kevin. What's going on, guys? Yeah, take it away. Thank you for having me, brother. Uh, this is the point where I try to share my screen and not ruin things. Here we go. We're going to try it out, folks. All right. All right. Look, hey, I didn't, I didn't break everything. You guys can see everything? Yes, sir. Perfect. So we're going to be doing a little intro into cocktails, specifically cocktails that use whiskeys. Before we get into all of the history and the purpose and the love and, and, uh, and the details and technique, I just want to do one quick plug for us guys. Um, this is our Facebook page. Um, you know, normally this is the point where I would, I would uh, throw a plug in here to, to support us by buying the whiskeys and Armagnacs that we represent, but Given that there are a lot of people that need your generosity and donations now more than us, all we're asking you is to, um, is to follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our emails. Um, we have a couple of great video interviews we just had with the master blender of Whistle Pig. We had the McAllen brand ambassador for NYC come over. And the more people that sign up for us and follow us on Facebook, the more influence we have to get even more cool people. We have a couple of master distillers coming up later this month. So um, the, the more support you can give us in that way, the better. And I, I thank you again for, for uh, giving me the time. But that's not what we're here for. We're here about whiskey cocktails. Now, there's a lot of, there's lots to go into when it comes to whiskey. This is not a whiskey 101 course. So I'm going to knock this out in about five minutes. But to really learn about whiskey, you have to understand how broad a spectrum of flavor it covers. Whiskey is really just this umbrella term for any spirit distilled from a grain and aged in wood. Here are a few different types, one of which you may be familiar with, it's bourbon. You can make whiskey anywhere in the world, but different parts of the uh, different countries have different rules on what constitutes their own local versions of whiskey. In America, you can make bourbon anywhere, even though 95% of it is made in Kentucky. You can distill it in Alaska, you can distill it in Massachusetts, you can distill it in Colorado, it doesn't matter, as long as it is made from at least 51% corn. It has to be matured in new casks, new, new casks that were charred, 
And uh, there actually is no age requirement for bourbon. You could, dis you could open a, a distillery on Sunday and then bottle a bourbon on Monday. You could throw a new make distillate that's clear right out of the still and let it, let it just glide through an open barrel with two open ends as long as it has, as it has touched new oak. Uh, to be straight bourbon, it has to be aged for at least two years. But this is why um, a lot of craft, craft producers that have only been around for a couple months can create a product and call it bourbon. Bourbon, by, by its nature, is going to be sweet, round. Um, think caramel corn, a lot of vanilla. And um, the world of bourbon occupies a very narrow field of flavor. It's very, very consistent in what it represents compared to other types of whiskeys. Here's some examples, by the way, at the bottom, uh, just to give you some brand ideas. Next type of whiskey uh, is obviously uh, Irish whiskey, one of the fastest growing whiskeys uh, in terms of sales globally. It has to be made in Ireland to be called Irish whiskey. Unlike um, the whiskeys of their, of, their, yeah, of their neighbors, you don't have to use malted barley. You can also use unmalted barley. The reason for this being when Ireland years ago was actually the machine of whiskey worldwide. They were at one, there was at one point over a thousand distilleries in Ireland. And then up until about 20 years ago, it, that number had gone down to as low as two. Thankfully, the, the, whis the whiskey boom has brought us back up to about 12 or 13 in, uh, in process of being opening or opened already. But the English tried to undercut the Irish whiskey boom, uh, you know, a century ago by taxing them on tonnage of malted barley, which is what you used to make whiskey in England and in Scotland. You had to malt your barley. You had to soak your barley in water such that it would germinate and uh, make it more easily uh, fermentable for the yeast. So you, could, you could turn starches into sugars better when you malt it. But the Irish said, well, if you're going to tax us on what's malted, screw you. We're just going to not malt it. And that actually lends a whole different flavor profile to Irish whiskey that you wouldn't otherwise get. Think more of that butterscotch and that, uh, these nuttier flavors. It can be triple distilled compared to single malt scotch, which is twice distilled. It has to be aged for at least three years. There's some options down there. You guys are going to be tasting red breast soon enough, I think. One of my favorite Irish whiskeys of all time. And uh, Japanese whiskey. Uh, the only rules surrounding Japanese whiskey, surprisingly, are it has to be bottled in Japan. You can source whiskeys from anywhere in the world, put it in a bottle in Japan, and you can call it Japanese whiskey, which is not to say that some of the, whis some of the finest whiskeys in the world are not made there. That's certainly the case. But I would ask you to be a bit more discerning when it comes to the, the brands you pick. Your, your Chichibus and your Yamazakis, your Nikas, these are all incredibly talented distillers that have a uh, have history of making whiskeys. Unfortunately, um, after Jim Murray and the Whiskey Bible, told everybody in the world that the best whiskey was Yamazaki Sherry Cask a few years ago. It basically overnight made all Japanese whiskey jump in price 10x, you know, it just, they just multiplied overnight. It was, they're just destroyed the stocks. I would plead with you not to drink Japanese whiskey that has an age statement on it for a few years. Give it some time to grow back because it's all going to be super overpriced. Um, and, and that's no fault of theirs. It's just, uh, it takes a long time for these old stocks to grow back. By the way, the famous Yamazaki Sherry Cask whiskey that came out, what was inside of it was mostly Macallan 25-year-old. Fun fact. You mostly are familiar with likely Scotch whiskey. There are five different types of Scotch whiskeys. I'm just going to throw them all up, up on here. Blended Scotch. You have blended Scotch whiskey. That's your Johnny Walker, your famous grouse. It's a combination of whiskeys made from different grains from different distilleries. There's no Johnny Walker distillery. There's a Johnny Walker blending house where they take whiskeys that were distilled from malted barley and whiskeys that were distilled from grain, such as uh, corn and wheat. Corn and wheat are, are referred to as um, grain whiskeys because they, uh, they tend to imbue a whiskey with far less flavor and texture. Malted barley is favored for its, uh, its enzymes that allow it to, again, convert starch into sugars and can create far more complex flavors uh, during fermentation and distillation. So uh, that's why single malts and malted uh, barley makes a more expensive product. You have single malt scotch in the middle. This, you can only make single malt scotch from one distillery and you can only use malted barley as your grain. 
sing a single grain scotch, you can use, again, what I was telling you before, the cheaper grains like corn and wheat. And uh, you can use column stills that are made out of stainless steel instead of pot stills, which are made out of copper. And you have to do it in, batch, in batches. It's a lot harder to do that. So again, you have single grain scotch, you have single malt scotch, you have blended scotch whiskey, you have blended grain, you have single grain, blended grain whiskey, and you have blended malt whiskey, which is a blend of single malts. There's a lot of whiskeys out there. It's, it's meant to be complicated. Blended malt whiskey used to be called vatted whiskey, but um, I recommend you try all of them and, and, and find out the difference in textures yourself because it's really fun to play with them, not just sipping them neat, but also in cocktails, which is what brings us here today. Begging the question, what is a cocktail? This is a little, uh, this is a little tiny script from a newspaper. It's, I think, the earliest known printing of the definition of a cocktail. This is in 1806 in a small Federalist newspaper that was released up in, uh, in Hudson, New York. And it says here that a cocktail is a, quote, stimulating liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. And we can knock out water here because any spirit is going to be mixed with some sort of water at some point. So really, a cocktail for our specifications today, spirits, sugar, bitters. Which begs the question, really, what is, what is a whiskey but a cocktail? Whiskey is a spirit that's, that's going into charred oak casks, and, and in some cases, toasted oak and even neutral oak. But if you look on the left here, these are the, this is what oak is com comprised of. You're looking at cellulose, which doesn't really do much. It just holds the barrels together. But hemicellulose, hemicellulose when you char a cask, all the hemicellulose turns into caramelized sugar. That, that Maillard reaction gives you all this really nice toasted sweet flavors. And the tannins in the oak can give you some of that astringency and bitterness that you might otherwise expect to find in, let's say, a cocktail that uses bitters as well. I would offer to you all that every single whisk you've ever had in your lives was a cocktail. Sugar, spirit, bitters. It's all about balancing everything in this perfect triangle. Now, when it comes to cocktails with us, what we're going to be making here today, you might be wondering, why would I take a perfectly delicious single malt scotch I paid some good money for and make it into a cocktail? Well, I'm glad you rhetorically asked that question. I would like to provide for you um, one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, it's by this dude who looks like, obviously, he's a latest companion. The Cocktail Guide and latest companion. I have, my, I have an old copy here that my wife got me years ago, and it is one of my favorite all-time books. Oh, man, there are some gems in here. And the, uh, the pictures inside are phenomenal, if you can't read. The original printing was in 1941, and I have an excerpt here that I'd like to share with you all, if you'll uh, forgive me. <clears throat> in the world of potables... A cocktail represents adventure and experiment. All other forms of drinking are more or less static. The approach of the wine drinker to his glass, while pleasant, is completely formal. A real wine bibber it forbids flowers upon his table because the perfume of a rose obscures the less potent fragrance of the grape. Beer drinkers lead a dreary and gaseous life. Ale, porter, and stout imbibers are also subject to similar gastric disturbances. Whiskey enthusiasts are cribbed, cabined, and confined to a three-lane highway. Straight, soda, or just plain water. But the cocktail contriver. You, woman, or man to whom this sermon is addressed has the whole world of nature at command. You are within yourselves potentially Mr. and or Mrs. Balboa on your honeymoon, standing on a somewhat bibulous peak in Darien, surveying a new and ever-changing world, the fruits and of the sea and the plain, the forest, the orchard, and the garden are at your disposal. I'll be the first person to say that the reason why I love whiskey is that you can, you can create, you can find so many cool flavors in these bottles, but you can do a, hot, a whole lot more with a jigger and a spoon at your disposal and a few spirits I recommend. That said, it's no surprise that people enjoy cocktails and uh, many people might order a cocktail, but the problem might lie in making that cocktail at home. A lot of things can go wrong. You might have, get asked the recipe from the bartender 
and they'll tell you, oh, it's just, it's just these three things, spin it up, boom, you're ready to go. But usually what happens your first time making a cocktail is something like this. And you're bummed out. This is, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not happy for everybody. You know, uh, you, you, you drink a Manhattan at a bar and then you come back home to make a Manhattan and it tastes like crap. Why did that happen? There are a few things that usually go wrong. And these are the most common mistakes and things I will, I will talk about over the course of the, the four cocktails we're making. Number one, people don't measure. I have a jigger right here. This is a, uh, an OXO angled jigger. You can find this in any kitchen store. It's my favorite uh, jigger to use. They come in plastic and metal. They are bulletproof and they measure down to a quarter ounce. The reason why you have to measure, even if you worked at a pub for a couple of you know, summers when you were you know, in college making some, some pocket change, you might be able to do a, an easy four count for your ounce out of a speed pour by memory, but you won't be able to get that quarter ounce or the three quarter ounce pour consistently. And that's the, the truth behind a great cocktail is making the same thing consistently. The second thing people do wrong is over dilute or under chill. This is usually by shaking a drink that should be stirred or vice versa or not using enough ice or using too much ice. We'll go over all of these things later. And lastly, using the wrong ingredients. There's some leeway you can have obviously with, um, with branding. I mean, obviously I represent a few brands, but if you don't have the, the exact things I have here, you, uh, you have a little bit of flexibility. There are certain things you do not wanna mess with. And that's something that you just kind of learn over time. Uh, if you wanted to make a pizza at home, but you did not have any tomato sauce, you should try to make the pizza with ketchup. There's a difference between some of these recipes and uh, that's where a lot of things can go astray. And I understand that it can be frustrating finding a new recipe that looks exciting and you have to go out to the store and have it delivered or, and buy a $40 liqueur uh, or this precious esoteric spirit that you, you might not otherwise know how to use. You make the cocktail once and it doesn't work and now you just spent a bunch of money on a thing you can't use again. I totally understand that. Take it slow. There's, there's no rush. Um, the, all the cocktails we're making here today don't demand very much um, and give you a lot of leeway. And what's not noted here, by the way, and which I'll get into later, these uh, recipes are not, are not um, you know, dogma. If I, write, if I tell you that a, a, uh, my Rob Roy is going to be two and a quarter ounces of, of whiskey and three quarters of an ounce of vermouth, we all have different palates here. I have an aversion to sweetness, so I might use less sweet vermouth. You might want something that's, that's not as strong, so maybe you want to use more vermouth to cut the strength of the whiskey. I would ask you to make it the way I have here first because it tends to be something that is widely successful. But after you have made it that first way, tweak it. Like any other dish you'd have at home. You know, if, if you don't like one particular, if you don't like cilantro in your guacamole, I'm not going to tell you to throw it in. It's fine. Uh, the tools. Oh boy, the tools. We got a lot of tools to cover. This is a, an idea of a shop here. You got you got strainers, julep strainers, Hawthorne strainers, you got fine strainers, you have different types of shakers, Boston shakers, tin on tin, cobbler shakers, yarrows, spoons, spoons with forks, uh, all kinds of cool stuff here. A lot of this is based on um, personal preference. And if you're going bare bones on tools right now, don't worry. Uh, the better tools you have, the more, the more consistently your cocktails will be made. And I'll tell you why I picked the tools I have here and what you can do to like cut around these, these corners if you don't have, you know, a perfect julep strainer such as this. And with that, we're gonna dive into cocktail procedure and mise en place, just setting up things over here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you're gonna be forced to look at my dumb face for a minute here. And if you can, uh, let's see, select me here. Provided everyone can still hear me all right. Yep, we got you. Can I jump in with a couple of questions that are really Please do. In? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of questions about like, I don't have Angostura bitters, I have a different type of bitters, I don't have this whiskey, I have a different type of whiskey, I don't have simple syrup, I have agave syrup. The question is, across the board, can I substitute things for things that were in the recipes? What are your thoughts? Totally, yeah. Substitution is, I mean, I, I'm a cook. I cook all the time at home. Uh, certainly more so now than I, than I used to. Um, if you have agave and you don't have simple syrup, what are you going to do? Not make the drink without, without sugar? You need, you need to balance it some way. The flavor might be a little bit different, 
but it will still give you a reasonable appraisal of that cocktail. And I would suggest in the future, if you like that drink enough to try it again the real way, then go for it. If you don't have bitters, I would say that making a Rob Roy or, a, um, or an old fashioned without bitters is gonna feel a little bit like making a red sauce without a bay leaf. Like you're just gonna notice something, there's something missing, you can't quite put your finger on it. But bitters does have a way of, um, bitters do have a way of melding disparate flavors otherwise together in a, in a nice marriage. The three types of bitters I recommend that you have, if you're gonna have three, the holy trinity, would be these guys. You're gonna have um, an Angostura bitters. The middle is the orange bitters. It has to be, it has to be this brand orange bitters. Angostura also makes an orange bitter. And then the Peixo bitters. With these three, um, you, can, you can make all kinds of fun drinks. It covers the whole spectrum. I would also throw in there for your approval, the chocolate mole bitters from Bitterman's, an absolute favorite of mine and one that I might be sneaking into a cocktail today. But don't worry if you don't have the right bitters or if you have no bitters, I would recommend them in the future. Um, it is an important thing to have, definitely. Any other questions, Kev? Yeah, um, just a question, and I know I've gotten this one a lot, but I'll let you take a shot at it. You see whiskey spell with an E or without an E, why? What's the, what's the difference between those? It's all, it's all about um, where that whiskey is made and the uh, deference to the earlier language from which it came. The word whiskey is, is a, uh, is, has Gaelic derivation, the etymology of which is water of life. The Gaelic um, term for water of life is uh, ishkebach, ishkebach. And ushka is a nightmare to pronounce, which is why we anglicize the hell out of it into whiskey. Um, generally speaking, if you were Irish or if you were Scottish Gaelic, that's when, you, that's when the E shows up or it doesn't. American whiskey has an E, as does uh, Irish whiskey, but Scotch whiskey does not. The general rule of thumb is that if, there is a, if the letter E is in the country from which the whiskey is made, then there's an E also in the word whiskey. But if you get it wrong, it's not a huge problem, yeah. and leave it to the folks that want to complain about nothing. A couple other questions about whiskey. Um, some folks asking about what, how does rye whiskey fit into the, you know, the structure that you showed? Totally, yeah. So um, rye, American rye whiskey, also made in America, instead of being 51% corn, like it's bourbon brother, rye has to be 51% rye. It's, you know, pretty simple. Uh, in terms of flavor profile, the four types of grains you're, you're most often going to find in American whiskey, and of course these, uh, these flavors can kind of transpose all over the world, it are corn, which gives you sweetness, which gives you smoothness, uh, not a whole lot of flavor, just kind of round, nice notes. Rye gives you that black pepper spice and a vegetal note, and malted barley, which can offer complexity, but is generally in America used as a, um, again, more for its, its enzymes that, that kick up your, your fermentation a lot faster. So for example, a, a, a common rye mash bill or, or grain recipe in America would be 95% rye and 5% malted barley, and spicy rye. You'll find a couple of uh, ryes that are 100%, kind of like Sazerac rye, and then you have ryes that are, are like barely ryes. But a good example of that would be um, Rittenhouse. Rye is bonded, it's bottled at 100 proof, but it's only 51% rye. The rest of it is corn and um, malted barley. But all these flavors have different, have different purposes, and that's what we're going to find that out a little bit more when we make cocktails with them. Cool. Uh, a couple others rolling in. I'm going to try and spread it out because I think, uh, I know I'm thirsty. I think everyone else is. Oh, yeah. So if we can get down to making a cocktail, I'll pepper you with them in a little bit. Yeah, sure, man. Um, the first cocktail we're going to make is actually the easiest one to do. It's also the easiest one to mess up and the one that I've had wrong every single time I've had it out to, to, to drink most often. It's a highball. And a highball is really, I mean, there's no sexy way of putting it. It's, just, it's a better version of a whiskey and soda. Most people that order whiskey, whiskey and soda, it's just a, it's a poor whiskey, a bunch of hotel ice that melts in the glass before you even get the drink, and a little bit of, of soda on top. It's not a very well-balanced drink, and it's usually, it's usually ordered by people that want to just cut the strength of the whiskey a little bit. But what I want to show you is that 
with the with respect to the highball, it's a drink that has been elevated, not just by the spirits we're going to be using, but by the technique. And the highball, for me, the, the one ingredient that you will not find, every, when you, if you Google highball recipe, the ingredient they will not tell you about is cold. Cold is an ingredient, very much like a martini. If, if a martini is not cold, it's not a martini. It's a nightmare. No one wants to drink lukewarm gin. So to make a highball, all we're talking about is whiskey and soda. We're going to garnish it, but we're also going to make sure that all of our ingredients are cold as hell. Um, before I grab my glass out of the freezer where it belongs, I'm also going to have a quick word on ice. This is the ice from my tray in my, uh, in my, my freezer. Smell your ice. Smell it. I, I guarantee you, if you are like me and you have ground lamb and chicken tikka masala and, and yeast and, and all kinds of crap in there and, and hot dogs and stuff, you will leach some of that flavor into your ice. So smell your ice right out of the freezer and then just run it under the sink for literally two seconds and then smell it again. You will notice a huge difference. Or you have a bachelor's freezer that has one Celeste pizza and nothing else. That might be true as well. I'm just telling you that it's, uh, you don't want to get those flavors as much as you like grand lamb into your whiskey. So give it a, give it a, give it a quick rinse. Um, if you look at my, uh, in my freezer, I have nothing but frozen glassware. So that is the first ingredient to this drink, a cold, tall Collins glass. Whenever you go to a restaurant, the food is always coming out on a hot plate, right? That's by design. You want to make sure that the food is hot and it stays hot so that when you get it, it's still hot and it stays hot longer. Same thing could be said for a cold cocktail. Always put it in a cold glass if you can. I'm going to fill this with ice. Sammy, while you're doing that, we had a question. Do you prefer cubed or crushed? Or can you talk about why you might choose one over the other? Always cubed for, the, for all the drinks we're talking about today, cubed all day. Uh, cubes have, have um, you know, way more, uh, way less surface area, so they won't melt as fast. We want these things to hold strong. The reason why the highball is an easy drink to make is because you, can, you don't have to worry about stirring it or shaking it. You can build it right in your glass. But the trick to making this drink from a good one to a great one, it's also freezing your whiskey. So I got a little Bob Blair 2005 here, a lovely single malt scotch, and it is ice cold. It won't freeze because it's, it's you know, there's alcohol in there. It's not going to freeze on you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure two ounces. Even though this is a two-ingredient drink, I'm still going to measure this. Two ounces of delicious. I mean, when you pour frozen whiskey into a, into a jigger, it just it pours like, like silk. I'm going to pour this right over here into the glass. Then I'm going to grab my chilled soda water I just made here. And I'm also going to measure the soda. A lot of recipes will say, like, for example, rum and coke recipe might read, add two ounces of rum and then fill your glass with ice and coke. And while that's usually accurate, um, I might have a different size glass than you guys. You know, you might have bigger ice than I do. These, these variables will change the, the mixture of your cocktail, which is why it's super important to measure. And I'm measuring six ounces because I know I like a ratio of three parts to one. If you want to then uh, take a spoon and give it a stir, you can. If you don't have a spoon, I have a metal straw because I care about turtles' lives. Uh, and, and because I was, I was forced into buying one from my wife. It actually is really nice and it stays cold. You can also use a chopstick for this. But that is basically your drink. It is cold ass soda, cold ass whiskey in a cold ass glass, a bunch of ice, and you got a highball. Sammy, can you just give the measurements again, the whiskey and the soda? I did, I did uh, two ounces of whiskey and I did six ounces of soda water. You want to use soda water and not club soda. Club soda usually has salt and or sugar added to it. And you want to, you know, you want to control all the variables here. 
this is where some, um, some subjective choice can come into play because I'm going to garnish this with some, uh, with some citrus. And I have a couple of options here. I have a fresh lemon, I have a fresh um, orange. The whiskey I use, Bob Blair, is aged um, primarily in ex-bourbon casks and therefore it has a lot of vanilla flavor. It is on the sweeter side. And um, therefore, I think I wanna balance that sweetness with the brightness of a lemon. Lemon oil is brighter and, and it's also, it's, it's zippy. Orange oil is sweeter and fragrant. But the way I'm gonna do this, and I'll do this in front of you guys, I have a little uh, potato peeler here and I'm gonna take this lemon, I'm gonna take a nice little swath like this. So that I have a little, little guy like that. There's two sides to it. There's the pith side, the, little, the white side, and then there's the juicy side with all the oil. I'm gonna take that oil side down and I'm going to squeeze it over my drink. And all that oil, all that oil is gonna come out. Provided you have a fresh lemon, I'm gonna keep on squeezing it until I get all that cool stuff on top. And I'm just gonna throw that bad boy in there. That is a ridiculously fragrant, cold, and super refreshing drink. The difference between uh, this drink sucking and, and it being forgettable is, is honestly leaving this on the counter for 20 minutes. It's not going to be cold enough anymore. So um, if you have a short glass, you can make yourself a tiny one. Just make sure your proportions are equal. But uh, the highball, it's, it's an old school drink. Depending on what part in the country you're from, if you're from Minnesota, you might be uh, mixing with ginger ale or, uh, or, you know, or you know, Verner's. You might be using ginger beers. If you're um, in some parts of New England, you might be using um, Sprite and, uh, and or 7-Up. That's where usually the 7-7 seven seven came from. Same idea. If you drink Jameson and Ginger, we're just talking about a cleaner, lighter version of, of any highball type of drink you've had. And the word highball, just so you know, comes from, uh, it was actually invented by a couple of, of uh, railroad workers. After working a long shift, they would uh, go to a bar at seven o'clock in the morning and they would order a, a tall drink. They wanted a lot to drink. And they named it after the long lever they would pull to switch the tracks. They had a long, they had a tiny little ball on top. So they called the drink a high ball. We want a high ball, just like that lever we've been pulling all night. You know, they say, Sammy, breakfast is the most important drink of the day. Oh, always. Yeah, my, uh, my, my grandfather used to tell me to uh, never eat on an empty stomach. <laughs> I had a couple more questions about this one. Um, questions around the soda water uh, versus seltzer. And do you have any thought about uh, using seltzer water same thing. Places soda. Yeah, seltzer, seltzer and soda water are the same thing. If you if you bought it from a store, it should just say carbonate, carbonated water. If you start seeing um, you know other sort of things besides water and bubbles, then it's uh, not quite the right thing. But you know, if you got club soda, it's fine. Hell, if you got if you got room temperature Sprite, throw it in there, man. We're just hanging out. Just I just to show you how I do it so you can do it the right way. On the recommended list of uh, whiskeys, this one was actually, this, as you're showing, the Anat Cutter was the recommended whiskey for this highball. How do you see a peated whiskey playing in this versus something like the Ball Blair 05, which I think of as just being a, an explosion of kind of ripe fruit? Sure, yeah. Um, I, the reason why I didn't use Cutter this round is because I'm just not in the mood for a little bit of smoke. Uh, I think that smoke plays really well with food, which is fun. But the fun thing about using peated whiskeys, if you are a, a peat fanatic, the highball is perfect for peat because you're doing two things. You're diluting, and dilution allows you to more capably traverse the nuances of flavor in a tightly packed whiskey, like, 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 a, like an Anon Cutter or a Lagavulin or, or an Ardbeg. But it also allows those phenols that carry that, that spice and that smoke to, uh, to be far more aromatic because the bubbles carry it up. So it's a drink that allows you to explore versions of, of your whiskeys that you love you might not have noticed before. So like if you have a favorite single malt, like if you, if you love Macallan 12 or, or Anak 12, or if you like Ardbeg 10, take a whiskey you know really super well and then make a highball out of it and it will show you a whole new world. And it's also perfect for the summer. Just make sure you keep that bottle in the freezer for at least a day. 
couple of questions about bitters too. Do they need to be refrigerated or some sort of uh, storage method that's appropriate for them? Bitters in a cool, dry area don't need to be refrigerated. Um, the only thing that needs to be refrigerated really are your citrus juices, your, your syrups, and your, your vermouths and your wines. Great. Um, and I think the last one is a number of folks are asking about whiskey stones. We talked about ice, ice, but if you don't want it to, you know, get diluted with the, the ice melting, what yeah, do you sure. frozen rocks? I mean, you know, forgive me. I have, I have a slightly uh, pointed um, opinion about whiskey stones, and I think that they are, they're, they're not very useful to say, to say bluntly. Uh, whiskey stone if you want your whiskey to be cold, just pop that baby in the, in the freezer and, and drink it cold. But the thing, the fact is that dilution is a good thing to have. If you want your whiskey to be cold um, and you don't want dilution, I can see a stone working, but the, the specific heat capacity of soapstone is such that it, it's, it's not going to be super helpful very long. Um, if you want to taste your whiskey a little bit better, I would say adding room temperature water is best because water dilutes your whiskey to, a, a, to a, a good point. It allows you to taste more things. If you chill your whiskey, it anesthetizes your palate. It numbs your tongue such that you cannot taste all the flavors. So chilling your whiskey is not a good thing for being analytical. But if you just want to have a, a good time and hang out on a Friday night because you had a rough ass day, throw ice in there. I don't care, say, you know, do what you want. I do the same thing. I throw cubes in my whiskey all the time. Just know what you're doing. And I would just say one last thing is that, you know, water does, what ice would have done had it not also made your whiskey cold. But the thing is that when you add water, you can control the dilution, whereas with ice, it's, it's, it's rampant. So uh, whiskey stone's not a huge fan. I like ice in the right situation. I prefer, I prefer neat with water, personally. Very good. I think we maybe have a few other questions rolling in, but I'm gonna ask if we can move on to cocktail two and we can pepper these in. We can do that, yeah. All right, on. so I'm gonna set myself up here. Move this out. Throwing the shit around. Boom. All right. So um, as we go forward, you might be thinking, why we're using why we're using single malt scotches instead of blended scotches? Uh, that's because blended whiskeys are they're inexpensive. You know, if you want to if you want to save some money, then all these drinks are also super great with with uh, blended scotches. But man, I'm, I'm talking a lot about uh, about tomato sauce today. But a, you know, you should use a, a red wine you would actually want to drink if you're making a red sauce. If you're not going to drink the red wine you're putting into your tomato sauce to make the tomato sauce, then it's not going to be a good sauce. Even in a small portion like a little like a highball, using a full-bodied single malt scotch is going to lend a lot of texture that a blended scotch just would not. And uh, you know, have fun. Yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. That's why we buy this stuff. I'm not saying that you should buy single malt only to mix it in cocktails, but just know that it can do a lot more things than you would otherwise give you credit for. Next drink, the Rob Roy. Classic drink based off of an even more classic drink, of course, the Manhattan. Manhattan is a, is a drink usually made with rye whiskey, sweet vermouth, bitters, and a cherry um, or, or orange slice or a lemon. The garnish game is kind of up in the air. Uh, that's kind of up to you, depending on your on your your mood. But the Rob Roy is the first drink that we're actually going to be stirring in a separate vessel because we want to control the dilution. Remember that every good cocktail is about eighteen to twenty five percent water. So make sure you're using good ice. I use my Brita filter for my ice. I'm in Brooklyn, so uh, you can only trust the water every once in a while, anyways. But uh, using good, good ice, diluting it properly, and then making sure that you are putting it in a glass that will not warm it up too much. We'll get to that in a minute. But Rob Roy, easy drink to make. The whiskey I will be using for this bad Larry is the Spayburn 15, which looks like uh, I'm using Spaberman 15 because I want a heavily sherried whiskey, a whiskey that spends most of its time first fill X sherry butts. Most of the flavor of any whiskey you've had was derived directly from the oak. So most of these flavors are dependent on, on the oak type, whether it was American white oak or Spanish oak. 
And what was in that barrel before you filled it with whiskey? Is it X bourbon? That means you're gonna get a lot of vanilla and coconut and caramel. Was it X sherry? So you're gonna get way more dried fruit and spice. These are all things to consider. Um, that's why I like this drink because you're pairing it with sweet vermouth, which will pair with the whiny notes of the, um, of the cask that it was aged in. Fairly simple. I've got my jigger here and I've got my mixing glass. Now this is a mixing glass, also known as a yari. It is a, uh, a heavily bottomed glass with a spout on the end here. And it has usually some cut markings in the side so that when you're rinsing it or, or washing it in the sink, you won't, you won't fall out of your hands so easily, uh, which has happened to me before. If you do not have this type of glass, you can use a pint glass. You can use any other, any other glass to stir your drinks. I'm using a lovely little spoon. You do not need to use a spoon. You can use a chopstick. You can use that metal straw that we used for this delicious cocktail. You can use your finger, it's fine. What you do need is some sort of straining device. You will see that I have a lot of them. These all have specific reasons. The first one being the julep strainer, the one that we're using for stirred drinks. This is what, is what allows me to hold the ice down into the glass while I pour the rest of the drink into the, uh, the glass I'm drinking out of. We usually throw it in like so. But back in the 1800s, this is a very old tool. It used to be put into drinks we'd be drinking out of like this. And this was actually served to you like so. Your drink would be in here with ice and whiskey. Remember, this is, this is back in the early days of ice and in the even earlier days of dentistry. If you were to pour a drink back into your mouth, and have your, your, uh, your teeth touch ice, it would be no good. That would be very painful for your nerve endings. Uh, and that's why they always had a strainer on top to make sure the ice never touched your teeth. Now let me flip it over, use it like that. This is a Hawthorne strainer, another super old tool that needs no, um, no innovation. If you're uh, close to Boston, you know that there's a bar named after the Hawthorne for good reason. It is a super important tool. And we use this for when we are shaking our drinks out of our tin. Again, same reason, to hold the ice back when we pour. If you don't have a julep strainer, but you have a Hawthorne, you can use the Hawthorne strainer in your glass. So if you're gonna only buy one strainer, I'd buy the Hawthorne if you're trying to save some cash. And the fine strainer or tea strainer, the conical tea strainer, we'll get to this when we're shaking things up, but that's to catch all of the little filaments at the end so that you don't get any tiny little ice chips in your drink, diluting your drink after you've finished it. But right now, it's a simple drink, we're just stirring. So all we need is our julep strainer. When you're building a drink in a glass, you wanna make sure that you put the booze into this glass before you put the ice in. If I put ice in here, it's gonna start melting. And if I pour whiskey on top of it, it's gonna start melting even faster. By waiting to put the ice in last, I control the rate of, of dilution. Because remember, I want to chill and I also want to dilute. My ratio for the whiskey is going to be two and a quarter. I do three ounce builds in my drinks because I think the drinks should be small because they should be enjoyed while they're still cold. You may have that one bar that builds you a, a martini in a glass that's the size of your head, but I, I just don't want to drink warm gin. I can't do it, man. I tried it. So two and a quarter of this bad boy, and then three quarters vermouth, sweet vermouth to be specific. We got two brands here. This is this is one we're going to be talking about, like the importance of ingredients. Puntume is a uh, is a very special kind of vermouth in that it is quite bitter. They actually add a bitter liqueur to this vermouth. Dolan Red or Dolan Rouge is a French vermouth, similar idea. It's a wine based. Um, sort of aromatized fortified wine that you use in cocktails. The word vermouth is actually derived from the word for wormwood, German word for wormwood, which is vermouth. What makes a vermouth different than the wine, like the Cabernet that you might be drinking at home with your meal, is the addition of herbs and spices and specifically a bittering agent, usually wormwood. Wormwood is the same thing that makes absinthe bitter. Okay, it's one of, one of many things at least. So when I'm, when I'm thinking about what sweet vermouth to use, I'm thinking about flavor profile, spice, and bitterness level. 
The Dolan Dry, if you're gonna only buy one sweet vermouth, is such a great buy. You know, it hangs in the back, it, it melds all the flavors. It's not too bitter, it's herbaceous. The Pinto May, if you're a bitter son of a bitch like myself, then you'll want this one because this one actually does pack a little bit more of that kick. I do think that it will be a little overpowering in this drink, so I'm gonna use the Dolan Rouge. And I'm using three quarters of this. So my ratios for this drink are three parts whiskey, one part vermouth. Jamie, a couple of questions about vermouth coming in. Yeah. Um, if you only have dry vermouth, not sweet, how could you adjust the scale to account for that? That's a tricky one um, because that's really, really super different. Um, so Dolan also makes a dry vermouth. Uh, I love I love both of the uh, Dolan products and they're, they're fantastic. Dolan Dry is not going to have any um, as much sugar in it as sweet is, which means if you made a drink that was meant for sweet and you used dry instead, you're going to have an unbalanced cocktail. If you wanted to use go ahead and use this dry vermouth, then you might be better off adding a teaspoon of of simple syrup or agave or something to balance it out. Um, Flavor-wise, it, it, it will be, it'll be quite a bit different. Um, there are two variations that come immediately to mind. There's the perfect Manhattan, which instead of using sweet vermouth, uses equal parts sweet vermouth and dry vermouth, but which is not helpful if you don't have any sweet vermouth. It's a drier version of a Manhattan. Another one is called an Old Pal. An Old Pal is a, is a whiskey drink that is um, it's, it's scotch, dry vermouth, and a bit of Campari. So if you have that bright red Italian um, aperitivo, that is a good thing to use it in place. But yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, I think the reason why I picked this drink is because um, everyone should have sweet vermouth in the house. It's a, it's, a, it's a liqueur that is, um, or rather, it's a wine that's worth having in your home. It goes in the fridge after you've opened it and uh, it lasts for a couple months. Um, but otherwise, it's, just, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a stretch, I would say. You're, you're better off changing off the whiskey than you are the type of vermouth for this drink. Another question was um, about Carpano Antico. Thoughts on how you would how you would use that? Same, uh, same as I just used. Carpano, Car Carpano Antica is actually made by the same company that makes Punta May, but they don't add the bitter liqueur. Uh, it's it's just a super full bodied um, vermouth, such that it can actually be too big. You're gonna get a lot of like bubble gum and vanilla flavors from that uh, vermouth. It's a, it's a famous vermouth, and it's actually the very first one that was aged in wood um, to be produced uh, widely. Love Carpano. I have it in my fridge. I'm using Dolan because it's a little bit lighter in body than the Carpano, but you can use this, you can use Carpano and Dolan Druge or, or Cinzano or Martini Rossi. All sweet vermouths can be used one to one to one to one. You can tweak them to your own preference afterwards though. Um, so remember, I have three parts whiskey in here and one part sweet vermouth. I'm then going to add a couple dashes of bitters. I'm going to keep it easy. I'm using good old Angostura bitters. Can't go wrong with these guys. It's a classic bitter. Funny story about the packaging. Anyone that knows this bitter will know that the paper is taller than the actual bottle, which is absurd. Um, the reason why that happened is because out there in the West Indies, when they were first uh, packaging this product, they ordered labels and they accidentally got the labels too big. But in the classic lackadaisical style of the West Indies, they decided, yeah, you know what? That's fine. Who cares? And they put them on there anyways. And it became this distinctive idea of the label, even though they've been making this stuff for years now. Like, you know, since 1830, they've been making it with the wrong size labels ever since to celebrate that, that notion. So it's a great bitter. Um, I absolutely love this stuff. A dash is about 1 64th of an ounce. It's tiny. But a dash is also a different amount from the top of the bottle from the bottom because the liquid has less room to travel when, it's at, when the wash line is up here. So one dash for me when the bottle's in the, half, in the halfway point in my bottle might actually require three dashes up top. It's not, a, it's not an exact science, and it's something that you can have fun with. I'm gonna do one dash and instead, and remember this stuff, this stuff will, will, will stain. So if you're gonna put it into the glass, tip it in like so. Do the dashing motion as close as you can here. I'm gonna do two dashes. 
And uh, if you get it on you, it, it immediately wash it out. I'm, I'm working on wood right here, so I'm very, very careful of that. You'll notice it's already changed color. It's already gotten a lot darker. Angostura bitters uh, lends a, a, a lot of flavors of um, cinnamon, clove, mace, allspice, baking spices. So, uh, two and a quarter whiskey, three quarter vermouth, two dashes bitters. We're ready for ice. Let's get some ice. You'll see that I'm using maybe a little more ice than you might think I need to. Almost double the height of the of where the whiskey is, and that's because this is going to dilute. I'm using a spoon, and I'm making sure that my spoon is always on the outside of the glass. What I do want to do is I want to make sure that there are no bubbles happening here. What I don't want to do is this bullshit that you sometimes see in bars. It's called the Boston Chop. I'm not sure why they call it that, but it's a nightmare. The reason why we're stirring this drink is because there's nothing to emulsify. You need to shake a drink if it has citrus or if it has dairy products. You do not need to shake a drink if it's all spirits and liqueurs. By stirring it, we, we, we retain the integrity and viscosity of what's in here. You might start seeing that it's starting to get chilled in the side. That's fantastic. That's what we want to see. But before you start thinking you're ready to drink, to, to pour it out, taste as you go. If you cook, you know you should always taste as you go. Any good, if you go to a bar and the bartender's not straw tasting or, or sampling cocktails as they make them, you're in a bad bar. Don't go in that bar. I'm actually really happy with this, but it needs a little bit more dilution. I'm gonna throw even more ice on top of this bad boy. I'll show you uh, again, if I'm just using a straw, you don't need any technique in the wrists. You can just make sure it stays on the outside. And it doesn't have to be super fast. You can do it super slow. The faster you go, the more uh, efficient your dilution will be. But we're all starting things out here. And before I answer some more questions, I'm just going to grab the, my chilled glass. I'm going to take my julep strainer or hawthorn, and I'm going to put it right on top. And I'm going to grab one of these fancy guys. I'm going to grab a coupe glass. That is also, as you can see, super cold. And the reason I'm putting it in here is because the warmth of my hand will warm this drink up. If you've ever seen someone drink, um, you know, cognac in a snifter, the reason why you have that full body bulb of a glass is because the warmth of your hand is supposed to heat up the brandy such that the, uh, the aromatics are, are more, more present or more active and you can smell it much better. Remember, cold kills aroma, warmth heats it up. Again, it gets really excited. I'm pouring this into a hoop glass so that I can keep my warm hands away from the cold spirit by using the stem. I'm sure I have some questions, Kevin. What do you got? Yeah. Um... What final volume did you dilute this to? What, like ABV? What, how, much, how much is in this coupe? Yeah, how much is, uh, what, what, yeah, what's the final volume? If I started with a three ounce build, um, I would say that I, I probably have, you know, another about just shy of four ounces in here. This is a smaller glass that it appears. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if your drink loses some strength, then you're, you're using then you're you diluted for a little bit too long, um, or your your ice is wet, or your your you know it could be a couple of different things. Maybe your your ingredients weren't quite cold enough. If you're using warm vermouth, that can slow things down, but you shouldn't have too much liquid. Right. <clears throat> um, there's a question about uh, using a metal shaker versus a glass. Do you have any preference between the two? Oh, if I'm if I'm going to stir uh, in a metal cup, you mean instead of in a in a glass. Yeah, you were. I think you were. You were mixing in uh, a glass vessel. You know, exactly. Yeah. You'd be okay to do it in metal. You can totally do it in a metal glass. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not a problem at all. If you um, if you don't have a julep strainer or a hawthorn strainer, you probably have some kind of strainer. It can be 
it's it can be silly, but short of you doing this with your hands to get to make sure the ice doesn't come out, I've done the conical strainer into a tin and done something like that before. You can MacGyver something to go out there. You're just trying to make sure that you're not sloshing things around. Because one thing you will notice with my drink is that there's no bubbles on top, as there should not be. It should just be a super serene top level here. And um, we haven't done a garnish yet. This is a take on a Manhattan, so as such, um, it, it usually requires a cherry, but you are, you know, you, you can do whatever you want, babe. Take, take control of your life. Put a cherry in there if you want. I recommend Luxardo Maraschino. I, again, do not like sweet things in my cocktails that much, so I actually prefer a lemon twist. Again, I like something that is bright, but if you want to accentuate the sweetness of this drink without having to munch on a cherry, I'll just use an orange peel, do the same thing. I catch a swath here. And instead of the lemon, quote unquote, balancing this drink by making it more vibrant, the orange swath will enunciate the sweeter notes uh, from the sherry cask and um, from the vermouth itself. And this drink will, will, will seem a lot sweeter. It's a delicious drink. If you're making this with Carbonell, it's gonna be it's gonna be a thick, be a thick drink. So you're gonna really enjoy it. Uh, the sherry is still I I still get the Spanish oak spice and the sherry coming through on the malt. If you were to use a peated whiskey for this, I do feel like it would overwhelm a bit. Um, but the funny thing about making a peated whiskey Rob Roy is it ends up invariably tasting like bacon. It's like a cool savory sweet thing. Um, so I'm, I know that's not much of a hard sell, but Try it. There was a question about uh, does it have to be Scotch to be a Rob Roy? Could you use uh, sherry American whiskey, for example? And is uh, is this really just the same as a Manhattan except using Scotch instead of bourbon or rye? It's literally just a Manhattan made with Scotch. So it, a Rob Roy, you can't make a Rob Roy um, without without Scotch whiskey. If you're making it with American whiskey, then you're just making a, a Manhattan. But you know, if, if you go to a bar where there's someone that doesn't know the name Rob Roy, they might refer to it as a, as a Scotch Manhattan and things like that. Uh, it's like the reason why we call things a vodka martini. A vodka martini is actually not the original name of a vodka martini. The martini should be just made with gin. But in the 50s, if you want, when vodka was becoming more popular, it had a real name. It was called the kangaroo. No one knows that a vodka martini is called a kangaroo because if you put a kangaroo on a menu, people would be like, what the hell is this? Can you just get a vodka martini? So part of this is it's, uh, it's, it's lingo, it's, it's some silly stuff, but the Rob Roy is a really well-known drink. And if you order it, most people will, will know how to make it. Uh, question about anyway, the, this, the same drink, like the whole, everything I just did, same technique for Manhattan, same thing. Great, great. Yeah, that's nice. It's easy substitution. If you have an American whiskey, you can just go ahead and make that. And if you've got a dry vermouth, now you've got a perfect Manhattan. And if you, put, if you switch um, the Scotch whiskey for Armagnac, then you have a French Manhattan, and that's dope. No kidding. <laughs> Sounds like we need another class on all these variations on a Manhattan. I'm here, babe. Um, does, does the glass that you put it into matter to you, the type of glass? I know you mentioned this one having a stem, so it seems like that's important to not let it eat up. No, totally, yeah. Um, it does matter for me. If I were to put this glass, if I were to put this drink into my water glass, into a heavy set, double old fashioned glass or a rocks glass. You know, it's fine. Um, excuse me, I would say the reason why you don't serve this with ice is because the ice will just kill it. The reason why you don't put it in a rocks glass is because it's gonna warm it up. So you have to decide what is worse, over dilution or over warming. That's why I make my drink small. You know, a small drink, you can drink it in a reasonable amount of time and you still, you're still enjoying it while it's still cold. There are a few drinks that warm up really nicely, but this is not one of them. And, um, and as I said, like the, the, the martini and the highball, cold is king. Um, and another one, do certain bourbons or whiskeys in general, or uh, scotches, you know, smoky versus non-smoky, lend themselves better to cocktails than others, in your opinion? I think, um, I think generally speaking, you want to use a whiskey that was completely distilled in copper. Um, we distill whiskey, distillation, the word distillation 
um, etymologically is derived from um, the trickle down. When you're distilling, you have, uh, you have alcohol, you have water in the bottom of a pot. You have a heat source underneath. And thank God, um, alcohol evaporates first before water. So the, all the alcohol rises up. And then you catch it in a condenser so that it turns back into liquid form. You catch that stuff, and, and you're good to go. You can, you can distill using any kind of sturdy metal, the most common being stainless steel and copper. But the reason why copper is favored, not just for its high ductibility, because it, it's, you can bend it, you can chop it, you can make it into any shape you want. It's also a natural filter. Copper, um, copper acts as a filter for sulfurous off notes and weird aldehydes that you don't want to end up into your, into your whiskey. Um, of course, a charred barrel also um, acts that way as a filter because the, the barrel char inside will act as a, kind of like an activated carbon. You know, it will, it will make sure that you're getting, you're, getting rid of, you're getting rid of some congeners that are otherwise going to be um, not very pleasing. But copper lends a whiskey body and texture in a way that a stainless steel continuous distilled whiskey will not. I do not like Jameson as a whiskey because uh, it's aged, it, it's, it's distilled in, in stainless steel. It's very thin. But I love um, Jameson 18 year old because Jameson 18 year old is actually all distilled in, in copper pots. It's hard to find that one now, but it's also why I drink Redbreast and Powers and Tullamore Dew. These are all these are Irish whiskeys that are aged uh, are distilled in copper. So I would say if you're mixing with things, body is important because you're diluting. If you're using an already thin spirit, it's going to die in the cocktail. Awesome. And James and 18, the Irish whiskey that got me into Irish whiskey, by the way. So good call. Yeah, man. It's, 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 a, it's a killer. We've got a few more, but I think they're not time sensitive. So um, maybe we can move on to number three. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Let's move some things around here. Did a quick rinse on my glassware, on my julep. Quick uh, rinse on these guys. This anymore. We're looking good. All right. We have a cocktail called the Old Fashioned, which is a, as you might imagine, old drink. Originated uh, many, many years ago. By name, probably not until the 1880s, but it, it had been asked for many, many times uh, colloquially, which is to say um, the late 1800s in America for cocktails were a really interesting time because this is right when we're starting to distill things that are not rum. If you're from Massachusetts, you know about the, the Great Molasses Flood of 1919. We were a rum country, America was, until, because, because really up to this point, like, you know, American whiskeys had such bad, bad uh, had such a bad rap. It was really, uh, it was really not ideal. I actually have um, a quote here, and I think, Kevin, you were part of this, uh, this class I taught. So you will love, it'll, it'll, this is old hat for you, but quote from uh, Warwick Massey Hoff in 1904. I don't care what laws you pass. I don't care what regulations you make. I don't care what safeguards you try to throw around it. The man who is willing to go to a bar and buy his drink has to take his chances, end quote. He was talking about bourbon. Bourbon was a nightmare. Like you, there was no rules around it. You were using ink and, and uh, prune juice, anything you could to make it look darker. This is also the time when French spirits are, are starting to come in. In New Orleans, you're starting to get uh, really cool cocktails with cognac. French vermouth is coming in, like the like Dunham Dry Vermouth. You start seeing Geneva coming in, the, the, the precursor to London Dry Gin. Uh, people are starting to mix all these spirits. Absinthe is coming in. People are using cool, uh, cool syrups and things. And there are a lot of guys that just come into a bar and say, hey, can I just have an old fashioned cocktail before all this shit happened with, with wines and, and cool French stuff? And that's what they would make them. They'd make them, again, a drink that was just spirits, bitters, sugar. That's what the old fashioned is. Um, an old fashioned also can be, just like anything else that we've talked about today, really easily mangled. Um, it's a drink that is sometimes built in the glass. We're not going to do that because. When you build a drink in the glass, you need to have really, really big ice cubes. I have sort of big ice cubes, but not quite big enough that I want to make sure I can control the chill. So I'm going to use a mixing glass again. You can also use a tin again, not a problem. The second mistake people make with this drink is that they, uh, they put too much sugar in there. 
So this is going to be a big discussion I'm talking about sugar. Uh, Y'all might have agave nectar. You might have maple syrup. You might have um, honey. There's a lot of ways to make a, an old fashioned sweet, but I tend to prefer cane sugar, just proper regular cane sugar, not domino white packet sugar. I, I want a little bit of depth of flavor um, in my syrups. Again, a simple syrup is one to one. If you want your syrup to last longer when you make it, because you shouldn't be buying it, you should just make it super easy. Everyone has sugar and water. Uh, try making it two to one, two parts sugar to one water. Uh, that will make it last longer. It, it's a harder environment for bacteria to grow. So you can leave it in the fridge and it will stay good for about two weeks. Make it in smaller portions than you need it so you don't have any waste. If you want to have fun, throw some, throw some spices or some herbs in there. If you want a mint syrup, just throw some mint in there. If you want a clove and cinnamon syrup for like winter time, throw some stuff, like have fun with it. It's cool, you can do whatever you want. This is, this is your world. Making syrups is the funnest and easiest way to experiment with cocktails. You might notice that my syrup is a little bit darker than normal. Um, and that is because this is not just sugar and water. I've also added um, gum arabic which is a really old school 1800 style of thickener that people used to use um, to make their drinks a bit more silky smooth. It's hydrocolloid, which is a fancy scientific word that I don't really understand. That means something that, all, that thickens and emulsifies your drinks. So the cool thing about using gum arabic or using a quote gum syrup is that when I make a drink and it warms up over time, the, uh, the molecules be, will be arrested in such a way that the first sip of my drink will be just as sweet as the last sip. It won't just sink to the bottom of the glass and it'll have way thicker texture. You can buy gum arabic powdered form on Amazon um, and it's not, it's not too expensive. Just buy gum syrup if you're interested in trying it out. Do not make your entire kitchen sticky with this, with this gum Arabic stuff. It is a nightmare to use unless you are a, a licensed professional such as myself. That said, if you do not have this, syrup is totally fine. I just wanna give you something aspirational to try out because uh, an old fashioned really kicks up into a new gear when you have gum in there. The whiskey I'm using is bourbon. I'm using E.H. Taylor. I actually did have a little bit of Blanton's last night and I killed the bottle. Uh, the reason why I'm using bourbon in this drink as opposed to let's say rye, because um, I feel like it, you can do whatever you want, man. Uh, they're, they're, they're interchangeable at this point. You can use bourbon for uh, this old fashioned and pair it with orange peel. I'm gonna use bourbon and do that. Uh, if you have rye whiskey, you can pair it with lemon peel. I think lemon and rye, work well. I think bourbon and orange work well. But it's the same idea here where we're going to measure our ingredients into this glass and then do the ice last. So this is a two ounce, uh, excuse me, a two ounces of your whiskey. I do recommend using American whiskey for this. Uh, I, I, I just, I feel like it's just a little better. It's a little more fun. For two ounces, I'm going to measure one quarter ounce of your syrup of choice. If you're using agave nectar, um, I would use a little bit less, tiny bit less of your agave nectar. I, I'm asking for a quarter ounce of simple syrup. Agave is a little stronger. Maple syrup is a little stronger in flavor. So you might want to also kick back on that. It's much easier to add more sugar than just to, to take it out. So I'd recommend doing that, especially if you don't, if you don't have any bitters. I'm pouring that in here. The thick syrup, so it takes a little bit, a little bit longer to get in there. For bitters, um, traditionally, I like to use a mixture of Angostura and orange. If you have only one or the other, it's fine. But I like to use on in total about one quote unquote goodly dash of each. That's the language used in a lot of old books one goodly dash. So now I have syrup, excuse me, I have syrup, syrup, uh, whiskey, and I have bitters. And I'm just going to give it a quick stir before I put any ice in here. I just want to make sure that it's, it's all kind of together. 
Sammy, can you just give those ratios again? Yeah, totally. Man. Um, so I'm doing two ounces of spirit. It is worth noting that the spirit I'm using is 50% alcohol. This is bonded. Um, and as such, it will hold up a lot longer um, to dilution and to other flavors in here. If you're using a whiskey that, like, like if you're using like old Overholt rye, which is flavorful, but it's only 80 proof, maybe throw in an extra quarter ounce, maybe another half ounce in there. Um, lower proof, it's, it's going to dilute faster. You're going to miss a little bit of the strength, but I would say two ounces of spirit, quarter ounce of sugar, at least two dashes of bitters, and, uh, and you're good to go to add your ice. And you had talked about doing a two to one simple syrup sugar to water ratio. Would you just cut the, uh, the syrup in half at that point? Half of a quarter ounce is, is roughly a teaspoon. So you can use a teaspoon. I tend to pile um, my little, if, I, if you have a bar spoon, it's a nice thing to have. But um, again, always under pour it the first time because you can add sugar later. Because remember, we're tasting as we go. All right. So now I'm going to throw some ice in here. I have my ice out. It's starting to get a little wet, so I'm going to add more than I might normally use. It's a nice little stir. And remember, you can—I mean, you can use your finger too. Like I, there's no need to be fancy here. You can make use of whatever you have in town. Just sip this. Because this drink is going in ice, it is crucial that you do not overstir this. I am done. This is ready to go. It is delicious. I'm going to grab another chilled glass with an ice cube in there. Boom. Okay. So I'm just going to pour this in here right now because this drink is dying. I wouldn't normally do it this way, but I want to make sure that's not diluting anymore. Because I want to talk about ice. As good as my ice is, and as good as your ice is, these usual cubes are not going to cut it for an old fashioned. I recommend getting a, a, a big silicone ice cube tray. These bad boys, so helpful because again, they, they make you larger cubes. Check out that sexy bad boy right there. That's what you want. I'm gonna give us a quick rinse in my, in my, uh, my sink. Do we have a, a question, Kev? Yeah, we have a couple. Um, can you comment on the concept of using a muddled sugar cube approach to making an old fashioned versus using simple syrup? I'd love to. Um, I'm gonna take my spoon, by the way, because I had to put ice in this after the fact, which is not the way you're supposed to do it, but I'm gonna take ice. And my, and my glass with the spoon over and use the spoon to slowly put it in so I don't splash it all over my damn self. And that is your old fashioned in a chilled glass. Right, again, this glass, just, I just put it in my, my freezer 20 minutes ago. It's not a big deal. You know, super easy to do. Um, wasn't a hardship. And because I'm using a bigger ice cube, it's going to last a lot longer. Now, the question about syrup is, uh, is actually a pretty simple one. Muddling sugar takes a long time. Uh, I have a muddler and I have raw sugar, but you're doing two things. You're adding time. And if you want to add, if you want to do this the long way and start in this mixing glass with your bitters, a little bit of water and some sugar cube and a sugar cube or some sugar, that's, that's, that's a really cool way of doing it. I'm not going to tell anyone that you shouldn't. The difference is in terms of flavor, besides that and making your syrup, syrup is just easier. If you're cooking this syrup, if you're, if you're on the, on the, in a little saucepan and you're adding two parts sugar to one part water and you're heating it up such that it will actually, you know, make, you know break down and you get a nice cool syrup, you're also heating up the, uh, the sugar inside and you will create new types of sugar. When you add heat to sucrose, you're creating glucose, you're creating fructose. A, uh, it is a fact that a heated syrup is always going to be a bit sweeter than a non-heated syrup. So if you're making a syrup and muddling it with room temperature water, it's gonna be less sweet than something that you heated on your, on your saucepan. It's this very reason that a lot of bars will, um, they'll take an empty bottle, fill it with sugar, raw sugar and water, and they'll just shake it up 
intermittently until finally, slowly, all the sugar dilutes without needing to add heat to it. There are a, there are a lot of people that um, in, in the industry that don't that think this is all kind of bullshit and that doesn't really matter that much. I would just recommend making syrups. If you're a home bartender, there's no reason to mess with with sugar cubes. You're not missing out on anything um, flavor wise. I would just make them doing what's easiest. Personally, I tried it both ways and haven't haven't noticed a huge difference. I use bourbon for this um, old fashioned. So I'm going to pair it with orange because I think orange and, and bourbon. Make a ton of sense together. Again, same idea. Cut a nice, nice big swath. Take the oil side out. Squeeze all that delicious oil on top. Rub your rim. Throw it in the glass. And that is your old fashioned. The reason why you don't uh, cut this orange and throw like pieces of orange. You're like, I don't want an orange wheel muddled into my glass because the, the juice inside the orange is, is acidic. It's tangy uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's non uniform. I'm gonna have like pulp in my glass. The, the oil on the outside of an orange is sweet and aromatic. That's what I want. I do not wanna change the texture of this drink. I want it to be delicious and nuanced. And I know that this is um, heresy for folks uh, in the Midwest or, or from, uh, from Minnesota that love having a brandy old fashioned with a whole fruit cup at the bottom of their glass. I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to yuck your yum, man. Like you guys can make a drink any way you like, but this is the modern style of making it um, so that every, every sip is, is consistent. Where I come from in Wisconsin, we make it with uh, Southern Comfort. <laughs> oh, goodness, can I, can I mute you? <laughs> Um, there was a question, you know, you talk a lot about keeping your drinks cool or cold on um, the glass as well. Do you have any cocktail recommendations that stay good as they warm up? Oh, yeah, it's a cool idea, man. Yeah. Um, there, is, there, are, there are a couple of drinks out there that are, remember like what we talked about that um, cold anesthetizes your palate and it rests aromatic compounds. Um, so a cold drink, while delicious and refreshing and certainly complex, will only gain in complexity while it warms up, but it just might not be as tasty. Uh, a good example of a drink that warms up well, because you can really experience more of the flavors, is, uh, is a, it's a take on the old fashioned called the Sazerac. And a Sazerac is served down. You've heard of a drink being served up. That's what we just did for a Rob Roy. This is a drink served up. It's in a drink such that all the whiskey is, is up top. Cool, it's good to go. Serving a drink down is putting in a rocks glass like this, but with no ice in here, because you want it to, to just sort of hang out and you don't want to have ice in there. You, you want it to warm up intentionally. And a Sazerac is an old fashioned essentially that uses Peixo bitters and absinthe instead of uh, Angostura and you know, just simple syrup. Um, a Sazerac is more of a 201 kind of class kind of cocktail because there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance that can go in there. You might convince me to make one uh, if, if we hang around for the after party and I can show you guys about it. That'd be a fun one to make, provided I haven't gotten wasted on all these drinks I have here. Um, but yeah, there are drinks out there certainly that warm up well. Excellent. All right, I'll let you move on. Yeah, man. Okay, so we're uh, now we're, we're at the most complicated drink. I'm gonna make some, some room for myself here. Give me while I reset. I'm also gonna offer my wife this old fashioned so I don't get too drunk. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah, she was excited about that. No complaints. All right. Whew. We're doing a scary thing, guys. We're shaking things now. We're not stirring anymore. No more easy, easy time out. Now we are shaking. And shaking happens when we start using uh, dairy, uh, when we start using citrus, when we need to emulsify our ingredients, not just dilute them. Now 
The next drink we're going to be tackling is called the Whiskey Sour. And the Whiskey Sour is a, such an old school drink. It's actually also the flagship cocktail belonging to a family of drinks called the Sours. You don't, you, you don't have to just make a Whiskey Sour, you can make a Gin Sour. You can make a, a Brandy Sour. Um, a Sour just means that you're using citrus, you're using sugar, and it also traditionally means you're adding egg white. Um, powdered or otherwise, egg whites became really popular for the thickening of cocktails as early as like the 1870s and 60s. And that's back when eggs were expensive. So think about the kind of people that are ordering these kind of drinks. This, this is fancy stuff. Um, for those folks that are uh, scared of egg whites in drinks, don't worry. The alcohol, like most of the things that cause salmonella are on the shell of a drink, they're on the outside of the, of the egg. Um, and most bartenders, most bars that, that um, know how to mix drinks with egg whites usually keep their eggs submerged in water with a, a light vodka solution to sterilize, quote unquote, the eggs. And they also throw a couple of lemon peels in the water vodka liquid so that the, uh, the eggs that have a permeable skin can sort of get infused with that lemon flavor. It's totally safe to use egg whites into a drink that are raw because the alcohol is also cooking off any of that weird stuff that might go in there that might make you sick. And remember still, if Rocky can do it, if Rocky can eat an egg raw, I'm sure you can do it with a little bit of whiskey. Come on, just take it easy. We're not gonna make the egg white fir drink first, we're just gonna make a, a classic whiskey sour, whiskey, citrus, sugar. Any questions before I start, Kevin? Nothing coming up on this one, nope. All right, here we go. People are, they're ready, they're ready for drinks. Um, I have a little bit of rye whiskey here. You can use bourbon. Um, this was, this was the, uh, the remaining of my, uh, of my Sazerac bottle and it will do very nicely. I also already squeezed my lemon juice uh, because I didn't wanna squeeze my laptop with lemon juice all over you guys. The, the recommended tool You've got to get one of these bad boys. This is really what you want. Um, you can use a reamer uh, if you want to make a goddamn mess. I find that these are the absolute best, not just plastic, but also um, the metal ones are great. This is uh, the right size for lemons and limes, which is why I like it. I also have uh, this old Le Creuset sort of footed reamer for a uh, larger citrus like orange and grapefruit. But generally speaking, this is what I use for my citrus. I squeeze it out and um, you got it. You got to use fresh citrus. This is one of those things we can't play around with. You can't buy that little fake plastic bottle of lemon juice. You can't buy sour mix. You can't buy lemon for concentrate lemonade and mix it out. It, it just, it needs to be fresh citrus that you squeezed within 24, 36 hours. It's just gotta be fresh. Um, I squeezed this an hour before we logged on. I put it in the fridge and you'll notice if you, if you watch the pH level of lemon from the moment it is squeezed, it goes up a little bit and then it takes a dip afterwards. So it's actually beneficial to, to let it sit for a moment so that you get um, the nice acidity of it. But this brightness is what's going to, what's, is what's going to balance our cocktail. Of all the sours you've had ever, and including margaritas, sidecars, whatever the hell you've had, what makes a bad sour is usually too much sugar. Sugar makes a drink flabby. It makes it heavy. It makes you feel heavy. It fills you up. Remember that um, sugar retards your, um, your appetite. So you're not going to want another drink. It's no longer refreshing. You want a drink to be bracing and, and bright and effervescent and fun. And the, the secret to that is using fresh squeezed citrus and making sure that you're using equal parts acid and sugar, or ideally a little bit more acid than sugar. You should never have more sugar in a drink than acid to balance it out. Sammy, just a quick one on that. Does the type of lemon matter? Uh, I would not use Meyer lemon. For this, uh, my, they're not in season quite anymore. Use your Meyer lemons for, for preserving lemons. That's what that's great for, for Indian and North African cuisine, but they're too sweet and too floral. Um, a fresh lemon as well. Um, and you wanna cut them 
uh, down the you know, equatorially, I, I, I guess I would say. If you see the, the shine of my lemon, that's because this is a fresh lemon I bought today. I always rinse my fruit when I get it, when I come, when I come back home. And it's not because of COVID, it's because you should always rinse these things because they usually have wax all over them. Rinse them, squeeze them. And if you squeeze them with one of these things, you'll see not just juice come out, but oil. All the oil that we've been kind of extracting at the tops of our cocktails is also gonna go into the drink. That's why if you take like a five day old lemon that's old and dry, you can still get juice out of it, but it's not gonna be the same flavor. That's why freshly squeezed is so important. But so uh, yeah, proper old school lemon. Our breakdown here is going to be equal parts lemon juice and, uh, and your syrup. I'm gonna do three quarters of an ounce and three quarters of an ounce. Three quarters of an ounce of lemon, three quarters of my syrup. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna lean any one way, I'd throw a little more of the lemon in there, but just if you have, if you don't have enough syrup, just make sure that you have more acid. I'm gonna pour that in here, let that come out. And then I'm gonna add um, two ounces of my lovely rye whiskey. You can use bourbon if you like. Bourbon is probably the more classic choice for this and the rye, the rye spice might be a little, it might, it might bump up a little bit with the acid, but it truly is, it's not that huge of a deal, depending on what you have. You know, we're all being flexible here. We're doing the best we can. Most of the green vegetables I've consumed over the past two months have been frozen. That's okay. So, uh, just like the Yari mixing glass, I put all the, all the ingredients I need in here. I'm not actually, orange bitters. Two dashes orange bitters. Boop. All my ingredients are in here. Now I'm going to add the ice. And as soon as I add ice, I'm going to shake the hell out of this drink. Now, uh, for folks that are new with the, if you have a cobbler shaker, a cobbler shaker is the type that has the, uh, has the body and then a top that comes up with like a little cap. That's a very, very common type of shaker. Uh, the reason why I don't, why I don't use those is because the, the seal can get like, messed up. It won't open the way I want it to. I can't control um, the way I strain it as easily. Using tin on tin or using glass on tin, if you have a proper Boston shaker with a pint glass with this, you get a much tighter seal. And it's much easier to open up afterwards. Um, just to show you before I add ice into this thing, when you, uh, when, if you want to seal your, your, your shaker, if you're not using a cobbler, you want to make sure that your, your, the tin or the glass is flush with one side of the tin and give it a tap. And that should be all you need for it to be secure. It will not come out. And then to undo this, if you have a glass or tin, remember you have this flush side, right? It's bent out on one side, it's flush in one. I keep the flush side to my chest at six o'clock. And with the heel of my hand, I tap tin on either three o'clock or nine o'clock if you're left or right handed. I, with my dominant hand, I give it a little quick tap, it comes right out. So again, make sure that's flush to one side. Not, you don't want to make sure it's right in the middle. You want to make sure it's flush one side, give it a tap, it's secure. And now I'm done shaking, tap on the side, come right out. Super easy. The Boston shaker is, is the specific name for using glass on tin. And it's great for if you want to make a lot of drinks multiple at the same time. Um, I use tin on tin because it's faster to work with. That's what I'm used to. Um, there's no, it's, it's all about preference. Don't feel like you have the wrong thing if you're using a cobbler shaker tin. So, so some ice in here. Let's make a drink. Sammy, real quick there, the uh, ratios again on the ingredients so far? Three quarter lemon, three quarter syrup, two ounces whiskey, two dash orange bitters, or what you've got. I'm secure, now I'm gonna shake. Make sure that the open ending is behind you and not in front of you. 
because you don't want to make people get sprayed here if anything comes out. Like I said, chill on the on the tin. Get all the nice liquid out. I'm going to taste first for balance. Maybe I use too much simple. Maybe I use too much lime. Lemon rather. Delicious. All right. I'm going to take my Hawthorne strainer. If you have a cobbler shaker, you don't have to, we don't have to worry about this. You just take the top off of your cobbler shaker so that you can spread it through the tiny little holes on top. I'm going to put my Hawthorne strainer here. I'm going to get my chilled glass. Normally, I would use a coupe glass, but because I'm going to also turn this into a new drink um, that I want you to see more clearly, I'm just going to use this type of glass. Use whatever you have that's cold. And this is when the fine strainer comes in handy. Because as good as, as your cobbler shaker is of keeping the big ice chunks in, and as nice as my Hawthorne shaker is, you're not going to get the little tiny chunks staying in this tin. Remember, we haven't used egg white yet, by the way. I see a question there. Um, but if, you're, if you happen to use egg white for this particular recipe, um, you, want, you don't want to use much more than an ounce. One small egg's worth of an egg white should be fine. So this is just a simple, regular old whiskey sour. And you can see in my little strainer here, I've caught some ice. These little tiny... Uh, crystals would have diluted in my cocktail and made this water down over time. This is a delicious drink. It's not the classic whiskey sour that uses egg white, but it's delicious. It's crushable. It's, it's super, super tasty. What I want you to maybe experiment with is making this a New York sour. And a New York sour is merely a regular old whiskey sour like this that we then float a little bit of red wine on. And I have a little uh, Crianza, a little Tempranillo that I had a couple of uh, days ago with my meal. The wine, the, the, the density of this red wine, and this is not removed, this is just a regular old red wine, is going to have a, a, a lighter density than the uh, spirit, sugar, and citrus underneath here. And what I'm going to do, you can see this all right, I'm going to take the back of my spoon. If you don't have a fancy mixing spoon, just use a regular spoon. I put some of the wine in a jigger, and I'm going to put the spoon inside the glass, right on the side, and pour the wine over top so that the wine is distributed evenly. I'm going to pour it nice and slow. Easy does it. You're trying to introduce this really slowly. And what you've done, should you have the stones to do so, the mustard, is to make a, a very complicated drink, the New York sour, which is just a delicious whiskey sour with a float of red wine. And this is actually a really great way to, uh, to save some, some wine that you had two days ago. It is absolutely easy to do, and it tastes delicious. And every sip you have, We'll have a little bit of this red wine in it. Yeah, it's delicious. It's, it's so good. <laughs> Making me salivate. Um, if I can interject, I think we had included egg white in the list of recommended ingredients for the evening. So a lot of folks out there, you know, saved one from their omelet this morning and are really curious how to put it to best use. Can you talk about how the egg could be introduced? And that's what we're doing next. Yeah, um, because the, uh, I would not recommend doing a red wine float on your, on your, <laughs> your egg white whiskey sour. I want to show you how to make it the regular way first. Now we're going to make the egg white style. And just like you guys, I also saved an egg white from, uh, from an omelet earlier today. Actually, uh, from making cookies earlier today, which I'm really excited about. So... Rinse out your, uh, your cups, your tans. Make sure you have a chilled glass hanging around. 
It's literally the same ratios we're talking about. We're doing three quarter, three quarter, two ounce, two dash. We're gonna build that same thing into our empty, our now empty tin. If you are allergic or, um, to egg white, or if you are vegan, then I would recommend using aquafaba. Uh, you, can, you can use that. If you have a, a can of chickpeas at home, open that can of chickpeas and save the juice inside. And it acts very similarly to, um, to uh, egg white, actually. And the, instead, of, instead of having a mousse, like the tiny fine bubbles, you might have more of a foam but it is very close and I promise you it does not taste like garbanzo beans. It actually is a really nice vegan way of enjoying this drink. So again, three quarters of my simple, three quarters of my lemon, two ounces of my whiskey. I'm actually a little bit shy, so I'm going to use a little bit of bourbon to even it out. I'm not gonna be upset, right? Don't tell anybody. It's all good. While you're mixing those, Sammy, sorry to just back up a little bit. Someone was oh, wondering how much wine did you float when you did the New York? Yeah, um, the, the wine I floated uh, it was just this silly, um, this Tempranillo I have, a little half bottle I've been saving. It's 14.5% uh, it's, it's alcohol by volume, so it's a, strong, it's a stronger red wine from a warm climate. But provided it is a, a red wine and it's not fortified, like you shouldn't use sherry or vermouth for this. You need to use a red wine because those, the, the vermouth and the sherries, they might have too much residual sugar such that they will just fall to the bottom of your glass. And you want that nice, like even as it warms up, this glass just looks really fucking cool. I'm sorry, it just it looks really nice. It's a handsome, uh, handsome pour. If you have a super light, um, you know, Pinot Noir, like a 10% Pinot Noir from Burgundy, that also works. You're gonna have a lighter color. Just think about the flavors that you're blending. Um, if you want something more, if, you, if you're making it with a rye whiskey, maybe use an earth-driven red wine from Bordeaux. If you're using a bourbon that's more fruit-driven and sweeter, maybe use a, a fruitier red wine like from uh, from the, from the Rhone Valley or from Burgundy. Um, if you want more tobacco and spice, use a Rioja. Have fun with it. Just remember, it's another way to use the wine you already drink. So try and filter it that way. But yeah, th there's no reason to, to, to over, you can use wine out of a box as long as it's the wine you would drink. And how much were you putting in there approximately? I poured, um, I poured one ounce into my jigger and then poured that over my spoon slowly. If you want more, go for it. Just remember that the, uh, the width of the wine on top is a, is a function, like the drink is a function of how deep a sip you have to take to make sure you break through that wine and still get some of the sour underneath. So if you have a thinner layer, then you will make sure that, it's actually, it's kind of fun to watch in practice. If I just pour this drink into my glass, you'll see that, is always going to be the same ratio of wine to whiskey coming out. So it's not like you're going to drink all the wine on top and it's all going to be gone. It's still going to be there consistently. Hmm. If you put a ton of wine on top, it might be hard to get. You, know, you might just be drinking wine and not drinking a whiskey sour, which is called a New York sour. So keep that in mind. Thank you. So I have all my ingredients in here. Um, I have my egg white, which is just the egg whites thrown in here. Now uh, the egg white traditionally, and remember, this is an old ingredient. Egg white's been used uh, for, you know, for over a century because people wanted their drinks to be thicker and emulsified. And, and you know, we were talking about uh, gum arabic. As, as it's, it's a hydrocolloid that has, that's been used for over a century. People want their drinks to have texture and viscosity. 
It doesn't matter how flavorful your drink is. If it's, if it's thick and, uh, and has fluff to it, then it's going to be a really more interesting, way more interesting drink to enjoy. But when you're using egg white, there's a different way that you have to make this cocktail. Because we're not just mixing and, um, and emulsifying like citrus. We have an egg white in here, which takes a little bit more work. If anyone has ever stiffed egg whites to stiff peaks in an attempt to make meringues, you'll know that you got to work this a little bit harder than usual. So what I'd recommend using is uh, what's called the reverse shake. Um, back in the day, um, and by the day, I mean like five years ago, if you made an egg white drink, you filled the, uh, you would you'd, you'd put the tin on top and start shaking this without ice. It's called a dry shake. But what we've learned over time is that you don't want to do the dry shake first. You actually want to shake this with ice first, strain out the ice, keep the drink in here in the tin, and then continue to shake without ice. You don't have to follow along with me. I will show you how to do it first because it is, it, it is, this is where things can get hairy. So again, I'm taking my small tin or, or my glass and I'm filling it with ice now. Take my tin, get a nice good seal, and I shake the hell out of this for a minute. Hold tin. It should be hard to hold. All right. Very, very cold. Slap the side. Open it up. And you're going to have a foamy mess in there, which is what you want. I'm going to take my Hawthorne strainer, or you're going to take your, the, the cobbler top of your shaker. And I'm going to strain this into my other glass or my other tin or a different vehicle. Just make sure that you pour your drink into this other vessel. What you're doing is you're, you're trying to get the ice separated from the drink you just made. Now you should have an empty tin of ice. Throw this in the sink. Now I have an empty tin and a tin with a cocktail in it. I'm going to throw this back in here, seal it, and continue to do it without ice, which is called the dry shake. Because Now I want to continue to emulsify it. So when you feel like it's gotten even colder somehow and possibly, or if you're just tired because you haven't been going to the gym and you have no upper body strength, you're done. Go grab a chilled glass. I'm breaking a sweat just watching you do that. Oh man, feel good. Whew. All right. Chilled glass. Got my lovely, eggy, delicious drink here. Got the hot one on top. And I got my fine strainer as well. I'm gonna pour this into my chilled glass. It's trying to get as much of this out as possible. Because you already strained this before, you're not going to have a whole lot of ice chips in here. So sometimes I just take my fine strainer and I dip the, the foam on top. It's all right. And some there's still some chips in there. But now we have a drink that looks like this. And we earned, we earned this drink. So this is a drink that rewards you for your patience and for your biceps. 
Uh, I'm going to let this do is I'm just going to let this set for a second. Remember, we have Angostura bitters. Egg white, for all its lovely glory of um, adding viscosity to a drink and texture and making basically like a milkshake, it also, um, egg white can also kind of give you that like wet dog aroma, which is not something you want to enjoy when you're having a drink. Remember, it's totally safe to, to consume, not a problem at all. Uh, but I like to top these drinks, excuse me, with a little bit of Angostura bitters. If you want to have fun with it, you can have a little design with it. I keep um, a little drop of bottle of Angostura. I just put Angostura bitters in a little bottle so that I can actually direct where the drops go. And I'm going to grab a little cocktail spike, or you can use a toothpick, little guy here. After this has sort of settled for a bit, I'm going to get you guys a better look at this here. I'm going to uh, sort of take these bitters and make a little design by throwing these bitters on top and dragging my I go through it, such that it looks like. Oops. Super easy to do. Uh, as long as you're too thick and you drop a couple dashes in there, even if you don't have the little, the, the hand, the hand dropper bottle, you can just have a very, very ginger pour from your actual uh, bitters bottle. But what you want to be smelling is you want to smell the, the, the aromas of the, of the bitters on top. And if you also want to add one more little you know, flavor nuance, you could do another little lemon peel on top, just over top very, very lightly. Again, just to help with the aroma. But when you take a sip of this, it is going to change your life and it's going to make you think why you ever used sour mix in a whiskey sour. It's like drinking silk. It's, it's an absolutely stunning drink. So much fun to have. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot of work. Tip of the trade, by the way, you now have a bunch of egg whitey looking tins and, and tools. Rinse them under cold water first before you rinse them with soap and water. Before all these drinks I was making, I was just rinsing them with, with, with hot water really briefly and using them again. I wasn't using soap. I was just kind of giving them a quick rinse. But when you're using egg white, Obviously, um, cold water is better because you don't want the albumin inside of the proteins inside the egg whites hard. Hot water and egg white is not a fun thing. So just cold water until it's all gone, then you can wash them up properly. I mean, I'm looking at my clock. I see 8.59. It's not too bad. I, I, uh, I, was, I was worried about keeping this under two hours, but uh, I feel like we did it. We're really, really close. This is great. Um, just a couple of last questions. Could you summarize the ratios again in the whiskey sour in the two versions? Yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, remember that you always want to have equal parts or a little more acid, acid to sugar. So uh, the ratio here was three quarters lemon juice, three quarters syrup, and two ounces of your spirit. Two dashes of, of uh, orange bitters is what I use. You can use whatever you like. If you make this drink and you find it to be a little flat, you needed more acid. If you make this drink and it, and it feels a little too sharp, you needed more fat. You need more of that sugar. Um, and if you feel like it's just a little too weak and it's not maybe your cup of tea, then that means you should probably be drinking more Rob Roy's. Hmm. Awesome. And the other one was, do you ever use a wire ball when shaking the egg white? A, a, um, a wire what? A wire ball when shaking the egg white. So, um, the, uh, the nice thing about a Hawthorne strainer is that the spring can come out. And some people like to take the spring off their Hawthorne and put this guy into their tin uh, when they're doing their dry shake so that you can have a little more action inside there when you're, when you're shaking it up. Um, I have found that it, it um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't hurt the process, 
but I also don't find that it makes my drink any better. And it's a whole thing, taking this thing off and putting it back on again. You can, you can do it. I'm not going to stop you, babe. But, um, you know, try it out side by side. Like, just, you know, be scientific about it. If you're ever worried about a, um, about one particular uh, variable, just isolate that variable and have fun. That's right. We know about that. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, we hit the nine o'clock. Very nice job. Thank you. I'm, I'm salivating watching you make these. Um, I think what we'll do is do the breakouts for about um, 12 to 15 minutes, and then we'll come back for the after party. So we're rolling the breakouts into the after party, folks. Again, we'd love to have you stick around. This is a lot of fun to just meet other pe people who are attending. One lucky breakout room is going to get Sammy joining as well. So, <laughs> you know, a little, uh, little bit of an incentive there for one, one lucky group. And then around uh, 9.15, we'll come back together for an after party. I'll unmute everybody and we'll just have a chance to chat with Sammy. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. And that will end that part.